Imagine it. So here's Herod's temple. This is what Jerusalem probably looked like in those times, the model of it. And this is the Antonio Fortress, where likely where Pilate was in this area. And, uh, you know, you're, you want to go to the temple. It's almost Passover, and it's almost time to bring the, the lamb without blemish here into the temple area so that it gets sacrificed so that your sins and your family's sins are covered and dealt with and atoned for for the year. So this is what was going on during this time. It's 32 AD, and you purchased your lamb in Bethlehem, right? You know, uh, one of the ones that were from Bethlehem. Those were the approved lambs, by the way. And you have your lamb with you, your family, and you have gotten to know it, and you thought it was cute. It kind of hurts to have to take it to go get sacrificed because it was with you for five days since Sunday. This lamb was with you. So you're you're ready to go to take it to the temple. You're a religious man of that time named Ben, and and you you live in Jerusalem. You're you're well known in the city. So you you walk down and and you take it into the temple area, and at the entrance of the temple, at the very entrance, right? I think it would be right here, maybe here. There would be a priest there, and he would look at your lamb as you walked in. You you brought your lamb, and he would scrutinize it, cross-examine it. He would inspect the lamb. Not once did he look at you, but he would look at the lamb, and he would say to you, I find no fault in him. And then when you have no fault in that lamb, you were able to go into the temple to worship God because of the lamb. The lamb was without blemish, and then it would get sacrificed. So this brought great joy to you because your sins and your family's sins would be forgiven, would be covered by the blood of the lamb, the perfect lamb of God. This was all according to the law of Moses. So this is a beautiful thing. And here in 32 AD, you were able to come into the temple and to worship Yahweh, to worship Adonai, the the great I am. He was here and you felt joy and peace as this was going on. But you heard some commotion over in the far, the northwest corner by the Antonio Fortress. Something was going on over there. You heard a large crowd screaming and yelling. And then something weird happens as you heard them cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Let's go back to this. Over here, you hear it and you're wondering what was going on. What, what, what is happening? So you walk over out of the temple court area into the temple court area and you're, you're going over here to the Antonio Fortress area and you see this rabbi who, whom you've heard about, this Jesus of Nazareth uh, who claimed to be the Messiah and he is whipped. He's, he has many stripes on him from the whipping, and he was beat up, and he was looked in poor shape, and the crowd was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Pontius Pilate said, but I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. And it reminded you at that moment, you, Ben, you, the Jewish man you are, you knew the scriptures, and it reminded you of the lamb that you just brought in. And it said, I find no, the, the priest said, I find no fault in him. And suddenly you look over and you see your lamb being sacrificed at the temple. Well, then you, you see the crowd heading up the hill to the east, going to Golgotha, the hill called Calvary, Mount Moriah, the very mountain that Abraham and Isaac walked up when Isaac carried the wood on his back. So you had a father and a son going up the mountain, and he was to be the sacrifice. And he was carrying wood on his back, and he was bound, and he was laid upon that wood. But as you follow this crowd up the hill, you see Jesus, Yeshua, and he's carrying the wood on his back. And he was laid upon the wood and bound, and, and then he was nailed to the cross. And he was put up on that cross, and you're blown away by what was happening to this poor man whom you th heard him say, I find no fault in him. Well, then suddenly he's up on the cross, and suddenly at noon, the brightest time of the day, suddenly it gets dark. It gets very eerie dark. And it spooked everybody there. It was so dark, getting pitch black 
dark for three hours and people were freaking out. It was this dark, my friend. So dark that you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. But during the last three hours of Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, an eerie darkness struck the land. It's recorded in the Gospels, three hours of darkness from noon to 3 p.m. And this darkness is documented by the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you want to look that up. And it is also confirmed, you guys, it's confirmed by secular, non-believing, by extra-biblical historians, Thallus, Phlegion, and Africanus. And I don't know if I pronounced those right, but these guys all recorded this darkness over the land in this, this very time of Jesus' death on the cross. So now we're going to look at the complete Jewish Bible and this complete Jewish Bible is great because it, it does a lot of the pronunciations like you would see in, in the Hebrew language. So here we are. Let's look at Psalms 22. Because this is a series we're doing in Psalm 22, you guys. And you're going to see an amazing thing in this psalm. Because even the ancient rabbis, way before the birth of Christ, considered this to be a messianic psalm, a psalm speaking about the future Messiah. And David wrote this 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. And it was like he was looking down at the scene that our fictional character Ben is looking at. But here we go. Let's check this out, you guys. Psalm 22, it starts this way. And it's an amazing thing because it starts in the scene that we're looking at, the darkness. And then the dawning of a new day. And then the rabbi. This is how rabbis would do it. They didn't have numbers, chapter numbers, or book, you know, the first numbers, none of that. They would announce the first sentence of, or the first phrase of that scripture to bring everyone to that part of the scroll, like Psalm 22. Check it out. Watch this. This is going to bring so much value to you. I can't wait. Here we go. Psalms 22 starts this way. For the leader set to the sunrise. Remember there was three hours of darkness? Guess what happens? Suddenly there was light. The scriptures record that at 3 p.m., suddenly there was light. It was darkness for three hours, but now there's a dawning of a new day, and that's the name of the psalm. It's the sunrise or the dawning of a new day. Aliyah Shakar, if you want to look that up. That's what it is. Suddenly there was light in Jerusalem, light shining upon the cross and where Jesus was. And what happens? It's a Psalm of David written 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. And there's something amazing I want to show you in a minute that happens here. But imagine this, you guys. Here it is in the timeline. David, 1,000 BC, before Christ, wrote this Psalm. Now check it out. Written by David, and here we go. This is the amazing part, you guys. Okay? I know I got more timelines here. I just like to show where we're at on these timelines, but here we go, guys. Here we go. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? What did Jesus cry out from the cross? He cried out, Eli, Eli. Lama sabachthani, which means, translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what it translates to, you guys. Oh my goodness. So here, Jesus, being the ultimate rabbi, takes everyone to Psalm 22. First, by nature, by this dawning of a new day, the, the, the sun the sun shining again after this darkness, that's the name of the psalm, the sunrise or the, the, the dawning. And then he says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Taking everyone there, you, that fictional character, Ben, he's taking you to Psalm 22. And Ben knew the scriptures and he started to say them with, as he saw Jesus and he saw the scene unfold, fulfilling these scriptures right before his eyes. My God, my God, Jesus cried out, why have you abandoned me? Taking everyone to Psalm 22, Ben sees this and he realizes this is being fulfilled right before his eyes. He sees Jesus on the cross, people mocking him and scorning and wagging their heads at him, just like the psalm says. But he also sees that it's the dawn of a new day. So Yeshua the Great, as I like to call him, 
the great rabbi took them to this psalm. Isn't this awesome? And then the psalm continues, why? So far from helping me, so far from the anguish, my anguished cries. My God, by day I call to you, but you do not answer. Likewise, at night, but I get no relief. Remember, it was just dark for three hours. He was crying out to God by day and by night. Ben realizes this was all being fulfilled right before his eyes as he cries out by day and then by night. Wow. So, verse 3, Nevertheless, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you rescued them. They cried out to you. They cried to you and escaped. They trusted in you and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. What does that mean? Worm and no man. Well, in the Hebrew, the word is pronounced tola, tola or tola. And it could be tola shani as well, which means scarlet worm or crimson worm. So what is this thing anyway? So this tola This crimson worm or scarlet worm, it's actually more of a grub-looking thing than a worm. And it was used in ancient Israel as the dye stuff for like the fabrics of the temple, the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, for the priest garments, for all these different things. We're going to look at that too. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. But it was about this big. This is about the size of it right here, about seven millimeters in diameter when it was fully grown and ready to give life to its offspring. About that big, okay? And this is likely what what it looked like right here. I don't know if you could see it in the camera, but that's what it was like. So let's continue in the scriptures or in the presentation. I'll show you more of this. So it was used for the red dye in ancient Israel. And it might be in verse 7 if you're in your Hebrew scriptures in the Tanakh, uh, you know, in, in the book of Genesis and the Torah. Um, it could be verse 7, uh, not sorry, Genesis, but the Psalms in the writings, right? But here's a picture of some of the dried, those are the tolas right there, each one. And they would dry them out in ancient Israel and collect them to make this red dye. And they would crush them. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you so you can see what that actually looks like. So here we go. I'm going to show you right now. So here in this uh, grinding stone I have here, you could see that there's some of those dried tola worms. These are the actual worms. I was able to purchase these online and had them delivered to me. So what they would do in ancient Israel is they would, they would take these and they would crush them, right? So you could probably hear it crunching and it's turning into a powder. And that's what they would do. And they would turn it into this, this powder, as you could see right here, and you could already see that it's turning red. This color is already turning red. And then they would add it to boiling hot water. And what that would do, here's some water right here. And then that would give them the dye for dyeing the yarns, the fabrics, right? So I'm going to dump that in there. And you're going to see that this is already turning red, crimson red. It's already like a pink color. And if you waited long enough, it would be a dark red color. Pretty amazing stuff, right? Isn't that awesome, you guys, how God put all that in the scriptures for us? Look at that. So they would take this and they would, they, this dye, and they would dip, like I said, the yarns in it, and that's how they would get their color for the temple fabrics, for the priestly garments, for all those different things from that little creature. All right, let's get back into the presentation. We'll continue on with it. So here you're seeing all those elements there. And uh, I'm going to move this down just a little bit. There we go. So they would find tolas. You could actually find them in the wilderness where the the children of Israel were in the wilderness with Moses as they traveled away from escaped Egypt. And they went into, they were there for 40 years in the wilderness. Well, this is called the acacia tree, or they call it the thorn tree as well. And some people believe that this is where they got the crown that was upon Jesus's head from the acacia tree, the thorn tree, because these are in that area and they have big gnarly thorns. They're they're nasty. But 
the tola would actually live on these trees. And so they harvest these in that area, right around the Midian area in the wilderness, the, the Judean desert where these trees grow. They're a miracle tree because they grow in the middle of the driest, hottest deserts, which provides shade for the travelers as well. But they, they would also find the tola there because they had to do that. In the Law of Moses, they had to get this tola creature to make the red dye for the temple, for the tabernacle fabrics and all these different things. It also grows on the Kermes oak trees in Israel. Even today, they're finding them there. In fact, the Temple Institute is getting that gathered today so that they can do, they can build another temple. So here's a another picture of the dried one. Here's one on a white piece of paper, and you can see the color coming from it. Here it is again. So here, I want to point this out. This is the tabernacle, right? So these beautiful uh, fabrics right here that were on the inside that you could see from the inside of the temple had this, all the red was from the tola. And then this skin here, which was the goat skin, was also dyed with the tola, that given it this red color, which to me would speak of the scapegoat, right? Which had the red yarn tied to it as it fled, carrying the sins of Israel away. Wow. So it's just an amazing thing that we see here. Here's the scapegoat, and he's tying the red, the priest is tying, tying the red yarn to it. One of them was sacrificed, the other one was set free out into the desert, never to be seen again. Just like our, our sins will be as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, which is a beautiful thing. When you believe in the Messiah, your sins are forgiven because of what he did on the cross, the atoning of his blood for us. All right. Let's continue on. So what this thing does is it, here's the lifespan of one of these little creatures. It climbs up, the female tola will climb up a tree or a piece of wood and it would attach itself to give life, to give life to its offspring and it dies. It does this one time in its life. So the amazing thing is these fabrics here it is, the, the temple veil being ripped in two when Jesus died. Remember, there was a massive earthquake, and the veil was torn from top to bottom, giving us what? Access, free access to God through Jesus, what he did on the cross. There's an actual picture of a mature tola as it's clinging to a tree here, and uh, this was what it would do is attach itself to a tree tightly. Like no one can break it off. You know, it's interesting that pomegranates are kind of the fruit, the pomegranate fruit kind of looks like here's a real tola, the shell of it. And these are all the little baby offspring, which they called the grain in Romans time. And it would turn white later, but here's what it, what it looked like. And it's very similar to the pomegranate, which I wonder if God had the pomegranate design inside of the temple for this very reason. Who knows? And the pomegranates the woven fabric uh, shaped pomegranates on uh, shaped like pomegranates on the hem of the high priest garments, right? Pretty amazing stuff, guys. All right, so here it is. There's the pomegranates and there's tola yarn mixed in there, dyed yarn mixed in with the bells. Here's the ephod, right? The, the high priest would wear. And then what this little creature did, so it stuck itself to the wood right? And it would give life to its offspring, and they would be dyed with that red, that crimson red dye for the rest of their lives. And after three days, the body excretes. It would explode, literally explode on that tree. And it would excrete a crimson red or scarlet dye that stains the wood red to where it was attached. You see in the picture here, my friend? <laughs> so it would stain the wood red, and then... After three days, it turns white like wool, like lamb's wool or snow. And then it flakes off and drops to the ground looking like frost or snow, like manna, right? That's what manna looked like, the bread of heaven. Wow. So then, guys, it would fall to the ground. That, that red spot would turn white as snow and fall to the ground like a snowflake. And that brings us to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. He says, the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, and that word is shani, they shall be as white as snow. 
Though they be red like crimson, and that word is tola, they shall be as wool or like lamb's wool. Wow. Isn't that amazing, you guys? So I don't know about you, but snow is so beautiful and so pure and white. Like there's times when this area would be muddy in the rain and dirt and mud and dead things, dead leaves on the ground, but the snow covers it and it makes it pure and white and beautiful and brings light too, right? And here's some yarn, some wool yarn from, and here's a beautiful lamb. And this is how your sins would be as pure and white as snow or like lamb's wool according to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Why? How does this happen? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that the perfect Lamb of God shed while he was on that cross, just like the tola does when it sticks to the wood. Wow. And Psalm 22, my friend, was written 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. Is this not amazing, you guys? How did God do this? Because he's God. That's how he could do it. <laughs> and by the way, I did write a book on this. Um, you can get it on Amazon or other places, but it's Tola Shani, and it's the Crimson Worm of Psalm 22. And uh, you can check that out if you'd like. Um, but anyway, hey, God bless you, my friend. This is going to be a series in Psalm 22, and I can't wait to get into more of it with you as we find Jesus in all of the scriptures, in all of the Tanakh. We find Yeshua, Mashiach, uh, in all the Old Testament. So God bless you, and I will see you next time.